Welcome back. Uh, we're continuing our discussion of the Jewish life cycle. Uh, the previous two sessions, we talked about the arrival of a child and the beginning of maturity with a coming of age ritual, uh, conventionally called bar, bat, or b mitzvah these days. And now we're on the next stage of life marked by many cultures, and that is uh, graduating from high school. Now, this is obviously before high school uh, existed. Um, it's uh, before you got your graduate degree or became a doctor or whatever. The next major transition would be marriage. In fact, you might remember in that list of the ages where different things happen, five years to study the Bible and uh, ten to, uh, uh, 13 to study commandments and so on. Well, the age of 18 was for the chuppah, for the canopy. That was the age of marriage in uh, rabbinic literature anyways. Um, so that was seen as the next transition, find a wife um, or find a spouse, we should say these days. Um, of course, every culture has some variety of marking creating a partnership or a pair bond or whatever we call it. Um, and, you know, again, as we've asked in other classes, uh, we can investigate the general human origins of this phenomenon. We know that um, there's actually a debate among biologists and evolutionary biologists uh, over whether humanity really is a pair bonding species or if that's a cultural construct that we have imposed on our biology. Um, because, I mean, there's certainly those in, uh, who call themselves the poly community or the polyamorous or even polygamous community who would argue that uh, there's nothing natural about only having uh, one sexual partner your entire life, um, and uh, or, or at least from a certain point forward, uh, once you start having children. Um, on the other hand, um, there are plenty of biologists who would see us as a pair bonded species compared to other species, uh, where swans, for example, they mate for life and they have one mate and that's, that's how they carry through. And we highly doubt that it's swan religious culture that's forcing them into this pair bonded arrangement. So. You know, you can make the argument either way. Uh, but in any case, that's one possible origin for the idea of having this marriage ritual. Um, obviously, there's also a public communal piece to this. After all, um, marriages, I mean, before you had the justice of the peace or the concept of elopement, um, they were generally understood to be public events, joining of the families, uh, a communal affirmation, and even permission to create this partnership. And in many cases, certainly before modern times with longer lifespans and the invention of something called contraception, marriage was about procreation. It was permitted, we'll call it permitted recreation and permitted procreation, okay? Uh, that was the model for marriage. It was the place through which to channel sexual activity in many cultures. Uh, again, not just in the you know, uh, Christian uh, and Judeo and Islamic cultures, but in other cultures too. Um, but most importantly, it was the vehicle for reproduction. Um, again, sometimes you had harems, sometimes you had concubines that could produce heirs that were legitimate or varying stages of legitimate. Uh, but in general, the marriage partnership was a license to reproduce. Um, and even more importantly, a license to know who the parents were. I mean, obviously, you always know who the mother is. But if you want to be sure who the father is, the best way to ensure that is to restrict sexual activity to the one male partner. Um, and so we can also see that there's a patriarchal edge to a lot of these marriage traditions because it's controlling the woman's sexuality in order to guarantee knowledge of the uh, male line. As just one example, um, when uh, the Bible describes taking a war bride, when you capture a woman uh, in, uh, in conquest uh, and you decide you wanna take her to a wife, you give her 30 days, it says 30 days to mourn her family, but one could say, hmm, I wonder what else would happen over the course of a 30 day period period, right? Um, I mean, then you would know if she were pregnant or not, and that would uh, then again guarantee your, uh, your parentage if you're thinking of yourself as the, uh, the uh, slave owner. So um, we have plenty of stories about marriages in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, again, they don't reflect the kind of marriage we think of today, but they certainly reflect the marriage of the early period um, in Jewish history and a sort of template for Jewish culture going forward. So here we have, as an example, uh, the text from Genesis chapter 2, where you have the creation of the first couple. Again, it's, uh, it's by design man and then woman second in chapter 2 with the rib, the woman as derivative and secondary to man. That's part of the uh, second creation story. And then after the woman is made as a help to match him, as it's translated here, an Ezer Kenegdo in the Hebrew, Adam says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. 
She shall be called Isha, woman, because she was taken out of Ish, out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife. Literally, the word is like from the same root as glue in modern Hebrew. Stick to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, they were not ashamed. So here we have this origin story, even before there are fathers and mothers. I mean, notice in Genesis chapter 2, there are no fathers and mothers, right? This is a later author, of course, not a you know stenographer recording these events, who's projecting back on this as the origin story for why a new household is formed from a man and a woman becoming husband and wife. Uh, although in Hebrew, actually, it's interesting. Uh, the traditional terms for this were, uh, the man would say, this is my woman, Isha. And the woman would say, this is my Baal, literally my master. That was the word for husband. Uh, nowadays, in modern Hebrew, it's become equalized, where you'd say, this is my woman, this is my man. and uh, Or again, uh, in the same-sex partnership, uh, that would be translated appropriately. So here we have this origin story for all of humanity, which begins with the primordial couple of a man and a woman that will lead to all humanity. In fact, uh, the woman is later called Chava, uh, translated as Eve, because she is the mother of all life. Uh, this is the beginning point of all humanity with this primordial man and woman family. Now, very early in Jewish experience, we know that this was a very patriarchal institution. We have a lot of examples of this. I brought just a couple here. Here in Genesis 24, Abraham is getting to the end of his years, and he says to his servant, go out and find a wife for my son Isaac. But notice he highlights, you shall not take a wife for my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. Stay within the clan, within the tribe. Don't marry out with the surrounding people. And we'll see this theme shows up, of course, in later generations on the issue of intermarriage. Uh, but it, it shows up again uh, more prominently um, around the time of the return from the Babylonian exile, as we'll see in a bit. Um, so the servant says, well, what if the woman is not willing to follow me to this land? Must I bring your son again back to where you came? What if she won't go sight unseen? What if I have to bring him back to prove to her that he's real and that, and that he's worth marrying? And Abraham says, don't do that. Um, I'll, an angel and, and Yahweh will be with you. And if the woman doesn't want to come with you, you're free from the oath. Just don't bring my son back there. And so ultimately, uh, the servant goes. He sees Rebecca um, and asks her, in fact, will you come with me? And um, Rebecca, as well as asked by her father, Laban, will you go with this man? And she says, yes. Yeah. So in this story, we do get a sense that the woman has some agency or at least some ability to, to reject. But we also see some of the more obnoxious pieces of this where Notice the servant brings forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and garments and gives them to Rebecca. And he also gave to her brother and to her mother precious things. This has an echo of what we would call the bride price, right? That you're, you're really purchasing this woman. Um, in other cultures, you have what's called a dowry, where the woman gets uh, a, uh, like a trousseau, basically, to carry with her into marriage, and that makes her attractive to marry. Uh, in fact, in the Middle Ages, in uh, Jewish communities, one of the uh, major tzedakah charity funds was the Dowry for Orphans Fund, so that they would have some kind of a dowry to bring with them into marriage um, that would make them attractive, uh, even if they were orphans and didn't have a father to provide for them. So here again, we have this concept of asking the girl, you see this uh, on the bottom of the page here, um, we will call this girl and inquire at her mouth. And they called her back and said, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. And so she goes with him. Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the evening time. He lifted his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebecca lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she got off the camel. Uh, now, one reading of this is that she was so awestruck at seeing him, she fell off the camel. You know, it's a sort of dramatic moment. Um, and she asked the servant, who is this man who walks in the field to meet us? The servant said, it's my master. Therefore, she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things he had done. He brought her to his mother Sarah's tent and he took Rebecca. The idea of to take the bride, Lakach, um, has a sense not only of to take as a wife in sort of the metaphorical sense, but also, honestly, in a very literal sec, uh, sense, sexual sense of taking the person. And she becomes his wife and he loves her. 
Again, notice he loves her after she becomes his wife. <laughs> Not the order that we would think uh, this would happen. So we see a number of details in this story that are worth highlighting. We talked a little bit about the purchase of the uh, bride going from one owner to another, basically from her father's house to her husband's house or to the, the family of her husband's house. Um, we also see that uh, she doesn't necessarily have her own property independent of what's given to her. Um, there's a lot of Torah laws that concern caring for the widows and the orphans, in part because the widows and the orphans were thought to not own any property or have any means of livelihood. They had to rely on the charity of gleaning from the field or the corners of the field uh, because it belonged to the men. And you would think, well, if, oh, if she's a widow, wasn't she married to someone? Well, yes, but if he died, she can't own it. Unless you think this is, you know, uh, ancient law of a backward time, uh, well, maybe it is, but it was also law even in America into the 19th century. One of the major issues that uh, early feminists were arguing for in the middle of the 19th century was the right of women to own property at all, even widows, because it wasn't assumed that that would be the case. It would go directly to their sons or it would go to uh, their brother-in-law. It wouldn't necessarily go to them because women weren't necessarily allowed or able to uh, own property. I mean, even into the, I think it was the 1970s, women were allowed to apply for credit cards on their own or sign a mortgage. You know, a man could sign her name and have it be legally binding to her. I mean, you know, so the, the, the idea of the woman as possession has a long, uh, far too long uh, pedigree starting even before this period, but it's extending into the modern period and reinforced by biblical passages like this. Now, another piece that uh, came into being, and it's also described a little bit here, um, as, as well as in other texts, is the idea that you have an engagement piece. That is, you don't necessarily have to um, take possession right away, as happens with Rebecca, because she goes right away. You can also have someone who is betrothed. You have an engagement. Um, I mean, we might also call it a little bit cynically a purchase agreement, right? You pay the bride price, the mohar in Hebrew, and then you've got this bride reserved for you. So here we have a story where Jacob meets Rachel and he is very taken with her. He kisses her and he cries. Um, he finds out that she uh, is related to him by being part of this clan from Laban. Remember the same father as Rebecca. And so they meet each other and they kiss and they reconnect. And notice what Laban says. He says, surely you are bone, uh, my bone and my flesh, just like uh, Adam and Eve, right? And then Jacob said to Laban, uh, Laban says to Jacob, what are you going to work for me? Laban had two daughters and Jacob loved Rachel, the younger daughter. And he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. Laban gives a glowing endorsement. Well, better I give it to you than somebody else. <laughs> Not really very uh, optimistic. Jacob served for seven years for Rachel. But again, she is like betrothed to him. He's, he's made this deal. And then when his time is fulfilled, he wants to, to go into her. I mean, this is really the verbiage that's used. Uh, to come upon her or to go into her, um, using like that locative verb of to, like to, uh, to come or to arrive. So Laban gathers together the men, they have a feast. So there's some kind of marriage celebration. We don't know exactly what the ceremony was, but there was something. And it came to pass in the evening, he took Leah, his older daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And then in the morning, he rolled over, and lo and behold, it's Leah. He says, what have you done? Didn't I serve you for Rachel? You've deceived me. And Laban says, well, we have to give you the firstborn first. And so he then fulfilled uh, the week with uh, Leah. And then he also gets Rachel as a wife. So what you see here is um, not only polygamy, of course, I mean, even polygamy with sisters, which in later Torah texts is prohibited. Um, you know, this is obviously a story from a different time and place. Um, we have this process of a week of wedding celebration. We have the concept of the older has to be married before the younger, again, independent of feeling or emotion or any of those modern factors. Um, and the fact that the parents are making the decision. You know, Laban is the one who's delivering the person uh, into the tent here. Um, we also find uh, in other passages I'm not bringing today, uh, concepts of checking virginity. You know, again, if the goal is reproduction and a purity of line, uh, wanting to know the girl is a virgin is part of that process. And there's even what are called tokens of virginity, which is like the bloody sheet. And you think, oh, that's so primitive. It's in the Torah. 
uh, that uh, if the woman is accused of not having been a virgin, her, a virgin, her parents bring the tokens of her virginity, the bloody sheet with them to prove that she in fact had been a virgin on the wedding night. So this is also a part of the, uh, the patriarchal culture that we're, we're seeing here. Now there is one piece where uh, Jewish culture, even in this early period was somewhat progressive. And that is in the concept of allowing for some kind of divorce, some kind of separation between husband and wife. This is described in Deuteronomy 24. When a man has taken a wife and marries her, it comes to, pa uh, to pass that she finds no favor in his eyes. He's found some uncleanness in her. Let him write her a sefer kritut, a book of cutting off or a bill of divorcement here, and give it in her hand and send her out of the house. And then she's departed out of his house. She may go and become another man's wife. So not only is she allowed to be divorced, but she's allowed to marry again. And if the latter husband hates her and writes her a bill of divorcement and gives it in her hand and sends her out, or the second husband dies, now her first husband is not allowed to take her again. <laughs> she is off limits. She doesn't get to reconsider, right? Now, there's no, no, no takesy backsies <laughs> when it comes to divorce in this case. But the fact that there is this concept of a bill of divorce, now here again, you can see it's initiated by the husband, right? He finds something wrong in her and they, they get a divorce. There's no provision for her to find something wrong in him. Um, and the question of what can be found wrong is a debate that the rabbis get into in later sources. Uh, one rabbi says, even if she burns his dinner, that's enough for him to kick her out. And again, put her into this category of a divorced woman. Well, while there is a possibility of remarrying, you can understand that a divorced woman might well be uh, in a much more tenuous position than someone who is married in, in a household. Um, we also have this idea that um, uh, this is where the beginning of the uh, concept of a ketubah comes from, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, now, as we know, there's no limit to the number of purchases that may be made, you know, of having more than one wife in Torah legislation. Uh, Moses has more than one wife. Jacob has more than one wife and two concubines in addition. So that, that's not a limitation. The, mono, the uh, monogamous limitation is not something you find in the Hebrew Bible. In fact, there's even this very strange case in Deuteronomy 25, which is called leveret marriage. Um, and this describes if you have two brothers that live together, both married. Okay, so two brothers, both married. One of them dies. Well, let's do this over there. One of them dies, and they have no children. So the wife of the dead should not marry somebody new and have them take over the land and the property or whatever. Her husband's brother will take her as a wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother. And the firstborn she bears succeeds to the name of the dead brother who is dead. So his name will not be forgotten. And if the, the brother-in-law that's alive does not want to take his brother's wife, then she goes up to the gate of the elders and says, my husband's brother refuses to raise to his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty. They call him over and he says, I don't want it. Then his brother's wife comes to him in the presence of the elders, pulls off his shoe from his foot, spits in his face and says, so shall thus be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house and his name will now become the house of he who has had his shoe pulled off. So again, you see this core focus on reproduction, on the line and the, you know, the progeny going forward, even to the point of allowing a brother to sleep with his former sister-in-law, I guess still sister-in-law of his dead brother uh, and to produce a child that's counted to his dead brother. I mean, it's a very odd law and it's one that was so complicated and so fraught with risk of you know, lust and adultery and uh, uh, coveting that the rabbis, you know, there's a long tra tractate on this called Yibum after the idea of uh, leveret marriage Yivama is the, the, the formal term, um, they basically legislate it out of existence and require the man to perform this ritual of the, the sandal to release her from her, uh, her bond to him. Now, this does lead to some problems, of course. If the husband is the only one allowed to initiate a divorce, or if the brother-in-law is the one who has to allow this release of the leveret mirrored situation, you can have a case where a woman is st stuck in a kind of limbo where her husband won't formally divorce her uh, or her brother-in-law won't formally go through this ritual of releasing her and she's stuck. She can't get remarried because she can't have more than one husband. This is the polygamy versus polygyny uh, split. 
where men are allowed to have more than one wife, but women are not allowed to have more than one husband. That is treif. That is too much. So this is the sort of foundation for uh, rabbinic practice, and we'll talk about the rabbinic ceremony a bit. I just wanted to highlight a couple of details that evolved uh, through the Middle Ages. Um, one example is the fact that today you have almost no Jews uh, who are practicing polygamy anymore. Uh, there are a few sects that are still, you know, uh, sort of hiding it and doing it. But what happened was this. Around the year 1000, a rabbi in Worms in Germany um, decided to enact a 1000-year ban for Ashkenazi Jews on uh, polygamy because it was not the practice of the people around them. I think Hellenistic practice tended to be monogamous, and the Christian church picked that up, so that uh, Jews were living in a setting in Europe where the surrounding culture said polygamy was wrong. And so they adapted to that uh, to some extent, and they uh, passed this ruling that uh, polygamy was banned for a thousand years. Now, if you do the math, by the way, a thousand years from the year 1000 uh, has expired. Uh, but lest, you know, you um, run out and start setting up a J-date profile for spouse number two, uh, at least, you know, if I were tempted to do so, um, don't worry. The rabbis of the day around the year 2000 decided we've done this for a thousand years. We're going to continue this tradition going forward, if not changing it. But you may have noticed this was a ruling that only applied to Ashkenazi Jews, to European Jews, right? Uh, but Sephardic Jews were not necessarily under that limitation. After all, they were living in a, sur in a surrounding culture under the Ottoman Empire or in Arab empires or even further east that supported polygamy. Under Islamic practice, you could have up to four wives as long as you kept them in equal standing following the model of Muhammad, who had four wives. So the, uh, the challenge was that while the Ashkenazi Jews said, no, you couldn't do it, the Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews continued to have more than one wife. Again, if they could afford it, it wasn't the common practice, but some did. Now, this became a particular challenge uh, after the founding of the modern state of Israel and the collapsing of these Eastern diasporas or North African diasporas, and with all of them moving to Israel, because Israel had inherited law from the British Empire that allowed only one spouse. So the compromise they made was this. They said, you can keep as many wives as you come into the country with, but you can't marry anymore. So by now, the practice in Israel is one spouse. Um, it is, again, it's a very odd offshoot sex, sort of like, you know, these uh, Mormon offshoots in the deserts in uh, Arizona or Utah that are trying to maintain the polygamous practice, but the mainstream Mormon church has left it behind. The same thing is true for Jewish life. Um, polygamy is, is in our past. Um, a second development that took place beginning in the Middle Ages is the tradition of performing weddings outdoors. Now, once you're doing weddings outdoors, you realize there's always a chance of rain. And so if there's a chance of rain, you might decide you want the bride and the groom to be a little bit sheltered from the rain. And this is the actual origin of the chuppah, of the wedding canopy. Um, it was not meant to be symbolic of the home of the couple they were building. It was not meant to be symbolic of angels' wings spread over them. It was not an opportunity to repurpose a talus into something. It's because there was a chance of rain, <laughs> because they were outside. Uh, it's the most plausible explanation for this. Again, other reasonings are added to it over time. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's also not unique, by the way. There are in Hindu weddings, for example, a tradition of what's called a mandap, which is a canopy that's set over the, um, over the couple during the ceremony. So there's other places that have this concept of covering the couple uh, for whatever purpose. Um, there were other challenges that came up when it came to dealing with the complex circumstances of ending a marriage and divorce. Um, so here's one example. Um, you have a husband who's a merchant. He gets on a ship. The ship sails away and he never comes back. Now, did he drown at sea? Well, if he did, then you could get remarried. Did he move to the south of France and start a new family? Well, if he did that, then you can't get married because, again, he could have more than one wife, but you can't have more than one husband. What if people reported the ship sunk? Is that plausible enough that, okay, it's likely enough that he died that I can get remarried? And then what do you do if somebody reported the ship sunk? The rabbi says, okay, fine. You were entitled to your uh, you know, end of marriage settlement and you can get remarried and you get remarried and you have another kid. And then he shows back up, right? This is the uh, return of Martin Gare. If you've seen that movie or read that book. Um, 
or I think it was Summersby was a Civil War era remake of that uh, in the 90s. Anyways, the point is, this is a complexity. What do you do? In fact, the answer that the rabbis gave was to declare the children mamzers, bastards, because she was never not married. She was always married to the first one, even if she didn't know it, even if the rabbis allowed her to do that. Um, or the other issue that came up sort of subtly that isn't highlighted in a lot of histories, but is very obvious if you study any kind of Jewish cultural diversity, Jewish men would travel for business. They would travel to be merchants. They would take the Silk Road all the way over to China and India. They decided to marry, guess who they married? Local women. Did they go through a rabbinic style conversion with a long you know, education process and go to the mikvah? And Well, maybe, but unlikely. Again, remember many of these cultures they're traveling to are patriarchal too. You want a wife, you get a wife. She does what you tell her, right? That's the, that's the model of that era. If you read the book of Esther, for example, it highlights that, uh, that chauvinistic approach. But this is why, if you look at Jews from India or Jews from Yemen or Jews from North Africa, they look different from Jews from Poland and Jews from Syria. <laughs> you know, they, they look differently, not because of the air and not because of the water and not because of the food, it's because of the people they married. And often if you do the genetic studies, you'll find there's a strong um, male chromosome, Y chromosome marker for uh, Middle Eastern Jewish heritage and the mitochondrial DNA, which you get from the ovum, from the egg that the mother provides, um, indicates that the maternal line is often from the native population uh, and not necessarily imported from somewhere else. So what this suggests is that uh, this mixing of peoples, despite whatever the Torah said about not mixing with the native peoples, has happened over many centuries. And that's why Jews look so different in different parts of the Jewish world. And the last point I'll make is in the Middle Ages, uh, it was very clear that marriage was not about love at all. It was a political allegiance process. This, uh, this happens in the Torah with David, and uh, sorry, in the Hebrew Bible and Tanakh with David and Saul and marrying each other's daughters. I mean, it's, it's all about political allegiances. This happens to, uh, with Canaanite princes and Canaanite princesses like Jezebel, marrying into the house of Omri. It's again, a political thing. Uh, it's not for love, for sure. Uh, in fact, while there is description of love in the Song of Songs, it's uh, love is almost always tragic in these sources. You know, you read even medieval versions of love stories and they're tragic. They, they, they want to be together, but they can't because their families get in the way. Uh, you know, it's not just Romeo and Juliet. It's a lot of other stories too. Um, so in this world then, um, you have these arranged marriages, and this is part of the process. Sometimes the arrangement will be made when the children were 10, 11, 12. You'd sign the ketubah, get everything arranged, and then you'd actually take delivery at some later point in time, maybe later in teenage years, 18, something like that. Um, and that's when you would actually have the wedding ceremony. So the rabbinic ceremony really developed into two pieces, the engagement piece and the actual wedding piece. Um, so you initially have the engagement, which is the signing of the marriage agreement, the ketubah. And in fact, the rabbis developed a standard text for a ketubah. Uh, ketubah simply comes from the root for katav, to write. So it has a very simple um, uh, original meaning. But here you can see the rabbinic text for the ketubah. Um, and you'll notice there's a couple of words missing here. So on the blank day of the week in the year 5,700 or whatever, since the creation of the world, in the era we reckon here, according to this city, that so-and-so, son of so-and-so, said to this, and they put in virgin if, it's apply, if it applies, <laughs> right? That, I mean, if they're not doing like medical investigation necessarily, but if she'd been married before, then she wouldn't be a virgin. But if she hadn't been married, she would be listed as a virgin, so-and-so, daughter of so-and-so. And again, you'll notice the family control here, that you're defined by your parentage, right? And he said to her, be my wife according to the practice of Moses and Israel, and I will cherish, honor, support, and maintain you according to the customs of Jewish husbands who cherish, honor, support, and maintain their wives faithfully. I present to you the marriage gift of appropriate divergence, if appropriate, uh, for this, of 200 or 100 silver zuzim, because, of course, used, you know, once you drive it off the lot, it loses half its value, uh, which belongs to you according to the law of Moses and Israel. I give you your food, clothing, and necessities, and live with you as husband and wife according to universal custom, and Miss so-and-so, the virgin consented to be his wife. So he says a lot. She doesn't say very much. Or at least 
That's what it predicts they will do. And so she brought from her father's house a certain amount. Uh, the bridegroom accepted this amount, and then he adds to it from his own property. And he says, the responsibility of this marriage contract, the trousseau and the additional sum, I take upon myself and my heirs after me. All my property will be mortgaged to secure payment of the marriage contract. Um, and so and so, this is part of the support given to the daughters of Israel. It's not a mere forfeiture. It's a real legal document. We have followed the legal formality of symbolic delivery, kinyan, uh, of the bridegroom and the daughter of so-and-so. And we use the garment for the purpose, and it's attested to by two witnesses. So what's missing here? Well, you probably didn't see the word love anywhere, right? You also don't have even the rabbi signing it. You have a rabbi checking the language, but you only have two witnesses that sign it, not the bride, not the groom, not even the rabbi. The rabbi prepares it, fills in the blanks, checks the language, but doesn't have to sign the document. Um, so this would be part of the engagement, and the engagement would be sealed by a sharing of wine. Um, and then you'd have the traditional marriage of the combination of the two individuals and the households and whatever, um, and that would also be sealed with a sharing of wine. And that's why in a traditional Jewish wedding, you actually have two wine sharings. If you watch the movie version of Fiddler on the Roof, just to pick one example, very carefully, you'll actually see them drink wine twice as part of that two-stage process. Uh, where the ketubah was written and signed. Again, that used to be done far in advance of the wedding. Now it's done basically the same time as the wedding, usually maybe an hour before, depending on how traditional the family is. Some will even do it during the ceremony and they'll take care of the signing then. But its original meaning was the fact that people could divorce. And so the woman would have no sustenance, no support as a widow, you know, again, as a divorced woman on her own. So this was the safety net. That if there was a divorce, she was entitled to get paid her ketubah. Or if he died out of his estate, she would be paid the ketubah before it went to his heirs. Uh, th that was, again, a, a way of uh, maintaining her. Um, and it also provided a disincentive to divorce, because if you're going to divorce her, you've got to give her all this money. This is like the prenup. Yeah, not particularly romantic, but does provide some measure of support. Now, of course, the challenge is that it's one-sided again. We're, we're seeing this theme as we go through the ceremony. So when it was time for the actual wedding ceremony, the engagement is called the erusin, and the actual wedding was the nisuin, which literally means the uplifting or the sort of display. Um, the, that bride price I mentioned earlier has become ritualized to a fixed amount and actually to a fixed form. It becomes a ring. And traditionally, it was a ring that was only gold, no jewelry or other you know, fancy decorations to it. Engraving, I think, was okay, but on the inside. The outside was supposed to be plain gold worth a certain amount of money. And what would happen uh, to accomplish the marriage, all you needed to do was the groom needed to give the woman something worth a certain value or the gold ring, as I mentioned. If it was a ring, he would put it onto her index finger like this. And he would say a traditional phrase, behold, you are sanctified to me by this ring according to the faith of Moses and Israel. And if she accepted it, which sometimes was accomplished by moving it visibly to her ring finger, she didn't say anything. But if she made a, a, a sort of implicit acceptance of whether it was money or this ring uh, as a symbol, um, she, they would then be married. If it was given with two witnesses watching and she didn't refuse it, that's it. There's even a, a rabbinic category of a kind of common law marriage. It's marriage by acquisition. <laughs> and you acquire a bride by, by having sex with her. So uh, there is even a concept of being legally halakhically married, even without a, uh, the special phrase, without the ring, without a ketubah, without any of this, because they wanted to, again, have communal consent uh, for legalized breeding. So you didn't have bastard children that had all kinds of legal disabilities to them. Now, as... Uh, developed over time, the rabbis added a special ceremony to the sealing of that giving of the ring with, again, a cup of wine. And so they developed what's called the seven blessings. And these seven blessings were recited um, as part of the ceremony after the ring had been given. Traditionally, it actually starts with the wine blessing. Uh, the version I have here has it at the end, but really that would be the first one, because that's the minimum you need to drink the wine. But then they added others that talk about creation of the world, creating humanity, uh, who uh, creates uh, humanity and, and God's image. But then as we see, as it goes along, it begins to talk a little bit more about partnership. So here we have on uh, this fifth one here, you make 
you surely make joyful companions, the lovers, as you've made joyful your creation, and you mesamea chatan v'kala. So you're, there's a sense of joy here. This isn't a purely, you know, um, mathematical, academic, economic partnership here. Um, same thing with the longer blessing here, which uh, blesses the uh, God who creates happiness and joy, groom and, bli uh, and bride, mirth and song, pleasure, delight, love and fellowship, peace and companionship. You make joyful the groom with the bride. I mean, really, this is this is an aspirational goal of a loving partnership, even if they didn't get to fall in love before, <laughs> before they were uh, made into a partnership. There's a concept here of love and commitment, or at least happiness, uh, that is envisioned for the bride and the groom. Now, uh, the other important part of the traditional ceremony was that when uh, the uh, bride was given uh, to the groom and she accepted the ring, um, there's a tradition that at the end of the uh, ceremony, there was a glass that's broken. Uh, this actually goes back to a text in the Talmud where a rabbi was very upset that they were celebrating too joyfully. He said, how can you be so happy with the temples destroyed and he smashed an expensive cup? That's actually one of the roots for this idea of the breaking the glass as being related to the destruction of the temple, which you hear in modern weddings sometimes. Um, but there was also a sort of pagan side to it as well. Um, that is, you're at a sort of liminal moment here. You know, you're transitioning status. And when it's open like that, the evil spirits are about need to be careful. So when the bride comes to the uh, ceremony, she might want to wear a veil to be, you know, extra careful. There's also the concept of going from her father's house to her husband's house and, you know, who gets to see her along the way. Um, and you also might have the bride circle the groom. Traditionally, the bride circles the groom seven times. Again, why seven times? Magic number. Why circle the groom? Ditch the, ditch the demons. You know, you, you got to be careful. And then likewise, at the very end, when you break that class, what does everybody say? Mazel tov, good luck, good sign, right? Good omen. Why would you say that if you're remembering the destruction of the temple? It doesn't make any sense. Great, wonderful? Yes, yay, the temple's destroyed? No. Makes much more sense as this kind of um, scare away the evil spirits, you know, uh, exclamation point moment for the ceremony. Um, and after the, the ceremony is completed, um, the bride and groom actually would have time alone for just the two of them. They would go into a separate room. They would actually have food there. Often they would fast during the day. So they'd be very hungry to eat at that moment. And they would create their partnership by having alone time with just the two of them. It's called yichud, unity or togetherness from the same root as echad for one. So the yichud was really the time when the wedding was legalized because the assumption was that was when the, uh, the partnership would be consummated. Um, I often comment to couples that I marry today, I will bet you that in 100% of the weddings I've done, no matter what happens in the Yehud room, that point was made a long time ago. You know, that horse left the barn uh, a long time before they're coming to me to actually get, you know, publicly married. Uh, I would be shocked <laughs> if that were not the case. I'll put it that way. Um, so in any case, the Yehud time, that meal together and the alone time together, whatever's, whatever happens there, um, is thought to be the real, you know, full consummation, finalization of the marriage. Remember, because you, you acquire a wife in many ways. You acquire her with a ketubah, you acquire her with the ceremony, with the gift of the, uh, the ring, and by actual sexual uh, congress. Um, so these are some of the classical elements. Uh, different rituals were added to them. Uh, there was an idea of what's called bedeken, where you check which bride is under the veil. Uh, this goes back to that story where we just saw Jacob and Rachel and Leah got jumbled up uh, by not checking. Um, so that's one of the rituals that takes place where the groom goes and sees the bride and looks under the veil to check. Um, you've got uh, uh, special dances that take place. Again, in Orthodox circles, men and women would dance separately, uh, where the bride and groom might have, you know, a sash or something connecting them uh, on either side of the mechitza, of the dividing line. Um, some of these things have been added as levels of stringency in recent centuries, and then they forget that they used to be more lenient in the past. That, that happens, too. Um, and of course, modern celebrations are very, very different. One last thing I'll mention, uh, sorry, two last things I'll mention about the traditional model before I talk about modern ceremonies is, first of all, there were certain days you could not get married. You could not get married, for example, on Shabbat. And there were really two reasons given for this. One is there already is a wedding on Shabbat. It's the wedding between Israel and Shabbat. 
Bowikala, Bowikala, come to me, O bride. Or Lechadodi, um, uh, come, my beloved, Likrat Kala, toward the bride. It's Israel greeting the Shabbat. That's the bride. You don't want to overshadow that wedding with another wedding, or you compete with it, right? But the other reason why you weren't allowed to do it is you're not allowed to do certain items of work on Shabbat, including breaking the glass, that would be a problem, and acquiring property. <laughs> you're not allowed to acquire property on Shabbat. Now, the irony is having sex on Shabbat actually becomes a positive thing once you're married, but you're not allowed to make the acquisition on Shabbat. So uh, also certain ho major holidays, you weren't allowed to do this because they're treated like Shabbat. And there are certain blackout days, you're not allowed to do it either during the counting of the Omer between Passover and Shavuot. And then in the fast days between the 17th of Tibet through the 9th of Av, which we talked about in our first session, that you know, sort of window of mourning days, you're not allowed to have uh, a wedding. The other traditional concept I wanted to share is the idea of what are called in uh, Hebrew or Yiddish, machatonim. Machatonim are the people you're related to because your kids married each other. Because chatan is the word for a groom, and a chatuna is a wedding. So machatonim has that same root in there. They're like, so it would be what my mother is to my mother-in-law. They are machatona, they are machatonista to each other um, because they are related because their kids got married. But you can see as well in a word that even has that concept, you know, in a world that has that concept of that one word, it's as much about families as it is about the individuals getting married. Okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about modern changes to the wedding ceremony. And there are a number of them, of course, worth highlighting. Um, I'll just highlight a few of them. For one, something called feminism. <laughs> the idea that women can be in charge of their own life and have some input, you know, uh, that women can work and don't need to be purchased, that women can be self-sufficient, that women should inherit property. That, you know, all these changes that I was alluding to as we went through the traditional stuff saying, this is what's wrong. Well, these are things that have changed. Um, and so a wedding ceremony is often a place where those kind of values get reflected. So maybe the bride wants to give the groom a ring and not just have the bride getting the ring and be the one that's marked as taken, right? Maybe it goes both ways. Um, in fact, I'll, I think of the 350 or so weddings that I've done in my rabbinic career, I think only one has had only the groom giving it to the bride because that's what they wanted to do. And I said, you know, fine, it's, it's your choice. But uh, that was, I think, only once that that happened that they did it that way. Every other time it's been rings both ways uh, as part of that egalitarian statement. Um, you know, other examples could be maybe they both break a glass. You know, who says only the groom has to break a glass? It's a little harder for the bride to see her feet under the wedding dress. It's a sort of practical side. Um, and uh, I did have one bride where it was a non-Jewish groom and a Jewish bride and she said, uh, I want to break the glass because I'm good at breaking things. <laughs> so now I can, you know, put it to good use. So, you know, you can be, uh, you can have some fun with it too. Okay, so that's step one, it's feminism. Step two is the idea of both birth control and longevity. Marriage is not necessarily about reproduction anymore. Either instantly, you know, right away, um, or needing to channel sexual activity when you're 18 years old because you can't control yourself. Um, well, you, you're not going to necessarily be producing a lot of uh, non-legitimate, uh, illegitimate heirs. Uh, and also, people sometimes have kids outside of marriage these days, you might have heard, you know, it's a newfangled thing. And, uh, and they're no longer considered illegitimate, right? That whole concept of an illegitimate child is really faded away, uh, at least in most circles. And uh, so the idea of reproduction only being happen, uh, only occurring within these socially sanctioned bonds of a monogamous marriage, I mean, that's, again, it does happen. It happened to me, <laughs> me and my wife, but it's not the only way the kids show up and it's not the only way that people get together. And as people live longer, you know, what are you going to do for two 70-year-olds that want to get married? Like, you're going to have to go through this rigmarole with a blood test? And a, no, <laughs> you don't have to do any of that stuff because it's not about reproduction. It's about partnership. It's about love and support. Very different values. Now, another major change that took place in the last 200 years or so is the whole concept of privacy, <laughs> individualism. <laughs> you know, I can live on my own. I can live with whomever I want. I can have sex with whomever I want. You know, I don't have to be married to live together. So now the purpose of marriage is very different. If the purpose of marriage was the ability to have any sex at all, it's a very different dynamic than a, a circumstance where you don't have to get married at all. 
And you might just do it for you know public purposes or sometimes even for economic purposes. I had a, a very sad uh, wedding once I did where uh, this woman had been the wedding photographer at a wedding I'd done a few months before. And she called me and said, um, I need to marry my 15 year partner because he's dying. He had been diagnosed with a brain tumor and was not responding to treatment. And he wanted to make sure she could have his social security survivor benefits. And they had never felt the need to get married. They were never having kids and they never did. And they lived together for 15 years. But when he was dying, they wanted to get married. So we actually had a very beautiful wedding ceremony, just the two of them in their living room. Didn't even need two witnesses in Illinois, you know, for legal purposes. Um, and it was both beautiful and sad in its own way. But, you know, people can not get married their whole lives and not need to um, because of that concept of privacy or being in charge of your own life. Now, we also have, since the French Revolution and the American Revolution, the concept of a legal government marriage separate from a religious institution. The idea that you could get married outside the church or outside of the rabbinic authority was inconceivable in the Middle Ages. In fact, it's one of the problems that Israel has today because they inherited what, for the Ottomans, was a very tolerant system. In the Ottoman system, you could get married by your own religious authorities and have it recognized by the government. So if you were Jewish, you had a rabbi marry you. If you were Christian, you had a priest marry you. If you were Muslim, you had an imam marry you. Wonderfully tolerant, right? Everybody do their own thing. They didn't envision the concept of secular people wanting to marry or people wanting to marry across the lines. Because you could, it, what? That was inconceivable back then, but now it's very conceivable. And because Israel inherited that uh, system, the millet system of religious categories, and there's a chief rabbinate, well, the chief rabbi wants nothing to do with a Jewish person marrying a not Jewish person. So it makes it very complicated. Um, but in enlightened countries in the West, we have something called civil marriage, which means the government will allow you to marry someone you choose as long as you're not still married to somebody else. That's still illegal, in, uh, again, in Western culture, following the Christian model. Um, and uh, you're not too close of a relationship. There are some laws in certain states over how close a relationship uh, can be to be married. There's also echoes of this in the laws in Leviticus that say you're not allowed to marry certain people or have sex with certain people. Um, now, having civil marriage enables two Jewish people to marry without a rabbi. It also allows a Jewish person to marry a non-Jewish person because it's nobody's business in the secular government who you're marrying. And remember those lines that all those ministers say in all those Hollywood weddings? By the power vested in me, by the state of... I mean, the irony is if they didn't vest the power in you, you couldn't do it. <laughs> I mean, see how things have changed. The state is the one that allows you to get married or not, independent of what the religious authorities want. There was actually a very clever amicus brief that some liberal religious organizations wrote to the Supreme Court shortly before the Obergefell decision that legalized same-sex ceremonies across the country, where they said, not allowing us to marry same-sex partners legally is infringing on our religious liberties. They took the religious liberty argument and used it to support broadening the franchise of marriage to same-sex partnerships uh, because it's, they were correct. By their religious tradition, they would be allowed to marry them. And by the state, they were not vested with the power to legally marry them. And so that was where they were pushing back. Um, so enabling intermarriage is a radical break from the Jewish past. Uh, we saw that passage uh, in uh, Genesis in Deuteronomy 7, it says very explicitly, do not marry your kids to the, those people's kids. You want nothing to do with that. They'll lead you astray. Uh, the book of Ezra describes very explicitly wanting the Hebrews to send away their foreign wives and all the children they had with those foreign wives. Now, there is the book of Ruth, which argues the other direction, because Ruth is a Moabite, part, supposed to be part of a condemned people who becomes the grandmother of King David. So, you know, maybe you can be reformed or redeemed or some way integrated in, into the surrounding people. Supposedly, she converts in the beginning, but she's still called Ruth the Moabite all the way through. So it's not really clear what's the, you know, what's the core message here. I think the core message is openness and acceptance. Um, and that's, of course, changed Jewish life as well. If you look at the latest studies that the Pew Forum on Religion and American Life has put out, um, the majority of Jews getting married are marrying non-Jewish people these days. Uh, and certainly if you're looking in the non-Orthodox population, it's even higher than a majority. It's uh, closer to two-thirds to three-quarters. Um, and so, you know, uh, referring to intermarriage as a quirky case is 50 years old now. Now it's one of the standards. You know, it is a Jewish wedding. It's just one variety of Jewish wedding, uh, and uh, they'll have different varieties of ways to celebrate that. 
Um, people like to include elements of both cultures sometimes. Sometimes they'll have two officiants, a Christian officiant and a Jewish officiant. Uh, sometimes they'll have a friend ordained on the internet and doing the wedding for them uh, of varying degrees of success because, you know, I mean, um, I can mow my own lawn, I can hire the neighborhood kid to do it, or I can pay a professional who knows how to run an edger. And if it's just my lawn, okay, what's the big deal? I'll do it myself, I'll have a friend do it, have a neighbor do it. Now, if it's electrical or plumbing work, I could open up the panel and start fiddling around, but I might wanna hire a professional for that because they know what they're doing, they have expertise and experience and knowledge. And now if it's surgery, I'm definitely not having, a, not having a friend get a degree on the internet and then cut me open, okay? So the couples really have to decide, is this ceremony lawn mowing, <laughs> plumbing and electrical, or surgery? And if they want it really well done, like surgery, then they'll hire someone who knows what they're doing. But plenty of people are flexible and they, they you know, it's like uh, mowing your lawn without edging and it'll be more meaningful if somebody who knows us does it. And so then it's very personal. Um, and that's really the core point of the new marriage for modern times is that it's marriage for love. Your parents aren't arranging it. It's not because of property laws. I mean, you might have a prenup or not, that's up to you, but that's not why you're getting married. You're getting married, at least ideally, for love. That was the exception. And now because love is love, as they say, and that applies to same-sex partnerships too, it's a radically different style of marriage. So I always will say to people, if they say, I want to restore traditional marriage. I'm a supporter of traditional marriage. I'll say to them, oh, so you don't like marriage for love without property rights. It's not arranged by your parents. Because traditional marriage was arranged by your parents for property rights and had nothing to do with love. That usually is what they mean. And they certainly don't mean polygamy, which is also the old fashioned way of doing marriage. In general, when it comes to secular and humanistic wedding ceremonies, the couple is the focus. It's not my event to be the star. It's not the parents' event, it's the couple. And so it should include what's meaningful to them and doesn't have to include what's not meaningful to them. So I often will say to them, um, if they want to include a breaking of the glass, that's fine. If they want to sign a ketubah, that's great. We can write our own text together. They can use a stamp, a standard sample, a standard sample that many websites have available. It's their wedding. Now, I can't argue with their parents over the guest list or, <laughs> what the flowers are going to look like or what hors d'oeuvres are being like. That's not my department. I'm not in charge of the reception. But the ceremony should be the, couple, the couple's expression of who they are and what they value. So sometimes you can be creative, like uh, the circling thing. Remember the bride circles the groom seven times traditionally? Well, a lot of couples today have the bride circle the groom three times. And the groom circles the bride three times, and they do one circle sort of a do -si do together. So it adds up to seven, but it's balanced. It's egalitarian. It's mutual. Again, giving two rings, breaking two glasses. Um, what my wife and I did actually was um, we each broke a glass, but nowadays you can get a glass that uh, the art company takes the shards and makes them into something new, like a mezuzah for the doorpost or a new kiddush cup or, or a plaque. And so what we did was we had two different colors of glasses, blue and green, and we each broke our glass and then the artist took the shards and mixed them together. So we have a mezuzah with blue and green glass together and a uh, Kiddush cup with blue and green glass together. Um, in the end, you know, um, people are uh, allowed and able to get married freely and for love, and that's a good thing. Um, and I do plenty of weddings for couples who may not be humanistic Jews, but they want someone who will do a wedding on a Saturday, which I'm happy to do. After all, it's not like I'm dragging people out of synagogue to attend a ceremony, you know. They're, they're already driving and taking pictures and everything else. In fact, this wedding might be the most Jewish thing they've done on a Saturday in a long time. You know, they're actually hearing Hebrew on a Saturday. When does that happen? So, you know, that's fine. Um, or on certain holidays, those blackout days, don't bother me. Um, but also I'm willing to officiate with one partner Jewish and one not, same sex ceremonies, co-officiating with other clergy, as long as they're willing to have a balanced ceremony um, and to be inclusive, you know, not necessarily make the sign of the cross over the couple, like that, that might be not appropriate. Um, I wouldn't use long paragraphs of Hebrew that I wouldn't translate because that would be alienating to those who aren't used to hearing Hebrew and to be honest, the Jews don't know what it means either, so it's good to translate it for everybody. Um, but really, we want to make the ceremony meaningful for them. The, the wedding today, the Jewish wedding today, is not a ceremony that's done to people. It's a ceremony that's done for people and with people. It's a very big shift. The traditional Jewish wedding was done to you. Nowadays, weddings are done for you and they're done with you. So we work together on creating the ceremony. 
And sometimes they say, I just want the traditional vows. And so first I say to them, well, there are no traditional vows in the Jewish wedding because the bride didn't speak. <laughs> um, you have to sometimes re-educate people. What does traditional mean? I want a very traditional wedding. Okay, you're going to segregate men and women? No. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's get down to brass tacks here. Uh, but really, we want to create it together. Um, so we give them options for vows. They can write them themselves. They can write what they want to say is they give each other the ring. They don't have to use the traditional phrase if they don't want to. They can be creative in the ketubah. There's all kinds of options to make this personally meaningful and relevant. And that's really the best kind of wedding uh, because it's celebrating this couple and why they're together and in love. And I will say of these 350 weddings that I've done, I always do a humanistic part of uh, what I do in the ceremony. Um, I don't talk to a God or about gods and I, you know, whether in Hebrew or in English. Um, I've had maybe 10 people come up to me afterward who actually noticed. Because I'm talking about the couple and how they fell in love and what they love about each other, and what's great about their partnership. And we're talking about the beauty of, you know, celebrating this culture and having the wine symbolizing the love they've built together. And I say some Hebrew, they see a ketubah, they see a glass being broken, they see a chuppah, they, they see all the, the things they're used to seeing for a Jewish wedding. And so it feels like a very Jewish wedding. And if I used an adapted version of the seven blessings, okay. So I have an example of that actually in the, uh, in the packet. This is, by the way, in the shared online folder. These are examples of humanistic ketuba texts that do talk about love and support and uh, building a home uh, together in that egalitarian style. Um, and an example of the uh, seven blessings done in a humanistic style where we are doing the blessing or we are feeling blessed to do this instead of talking about God. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's part of the process. There's also some of the sources on intermarriage that I uh, mentioned earlier that we don't have time to get into today. So I do commend those to uh, reading on your own if you want to uh, at a later time. Uh, but that's the overview of wedding from a humanistic Jewish perspective. We're doing Jewish weddings because of all those symbols that I mentioned uh, and the use of language and the use of the uh, ritual practice. Uh, but we're also doing human weddings for human people. And we want it to be meaningful and relevant to them. And that's why we're willing to make the changes that we do. After all, tradition is wonderful until it gets in your way. And then you're allowed to say, I want to do it differently. Um, I even had one wedding where they said, we're going to have a, a relative of ours blow the shofar at the beginning of the wedding. And I said, great. <laughs> it was not Rosh Hashanah. It wasn't even Shabbat. And there was a tradition of blowing shofar at the beginning of Shabbat at one time, as we saw. But doesn't matter. It's a Jewish symbol. It sounds Jewish. It looks Jewish. It feels Jewish. They want to bring it in. Works for me. Works for me. You can do wonderful things with Havdalah too. I mean, you can be very creative once you're open to doing it on Saturday and to being creative with Jewish culture. There's all kinds of resources you can bring into the wedding. And uh, it means that no two weddings are exactly the same because no two couples, no two loves are exactly the same. And that's as it should be. So that's an overview of the traditional Jewish wedding and uh, humanistic approaches to it. Any last uh, thoughts, comments, questions? Your reference to the, you know, Havdalah being tied in maybe just immediately made me think you can have a divorce ceremony tied in with Havdalah even better. <laughs> well, yeah, like uh, now he's on the other side. I mean, there is a ritual of divorce called, uh, you receive what's called a get. In Yiddish, get is the term for that bill of divorcement. Actually, I think it's in Hebrew too, because the tractate on it in the Talmud is gitin. So get is the Hebrew term, not just Yiddish. Um, but there's a ritual that takes place where it's written out by the scribes and the bride shows up and it's put into her hand and she's told, you know, you're divorced, you're divorced, you're divorced, you're away from me. Uh, three times to make sure he's sure that he wants to do it. And then she has to leave. Um, there is a whole ritual involved in it. If you want to see a version of this, by the way, if you've ever seen the movie Hester Street, which is a story of Jewish immigrants coming to America, another spoiler alert, there's a divorce at the end of the movie, um, but it's done in a very traditional style. And you might even recognize if you're sharp-eyed, but I'll give it away, the rabbi who officiates at the ceremony of the divorce is the actor who plays the rabbi in Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> it's the same actor. Um, so he, he got typecast, I guess, as the rabbi. Um, but uh, it shows you that ritual of divorce. Now, could secular people have a divorce ritual beside going to the bar or going to Las Vegas? Yes, we could come up with something. But in general, it's also a very painful process, you know, and even a funeral, as we'll see next time, can have a cathartic, even a joyful celebration of life kind of ethos to it. Divorce is generally, this was really painful and I'm glad it's over. And like, you know, I want to be done with it. 
you know, maybe you have a ritual burning of objects or something. I mean, you could do things with it if you wanted to. Um, and some people have tried that, but it's not the kind of thing, again, that you would create a formula template for. Um, I think you might, you know, sort of uh, create it together with someone who wanted that and, and maybe have dollar would be a good time to do it. But it certainly works wonderfully for weddings because it's, you know, a, a, a break with the past and a new step forward and all these symbols connected to memory, like the smelling of spices and the, you know, uh, the tasting of the wine and the sights of the candle and all that. So it really works well. Again, if you're willing to do the wedding, you know, around the time of sundown, that's great. Um, a traditional Jewish ceremony wouldn't happen until well after sundown. Um, and that's why Orthodox weddings actually are sometimes on Thursdays or on Tuesdays. It's, it's easier to get the rental hall <laughs> available and you don't have to deal with the hoopla around Shabbat. And certainly in the summer, you can have it at a much more reasonable time. If you had to wait for sundown, uh, that'd be a very late wedding. All right. Well, thanks for your time and attention. And uh, next time we'll be talking about memorials and saying goodbye. A lot of traditional rituals around that, a lot of human needs connected to that. As we know, as people are born, people die. Everything that lives will die. And uh, so human cultures created many rituals around this and Jewish culture being human is no different. So we'll find more out about that next time.